Hi, everybody. Welcome to SoCal Loopers. And we have, uh, as I've been announcing to everyone, a very, very special guest today. And you're going to be happy you're here. Uh, so we're going to be talking with Dr. Bruce Buckingham from Stanford Diabetes Research Center. Um, you will learn a lot and you can ask a lot of questions and we're going to put that all out there. We're going to do our regular disclaimer uh, that Loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm. And while it may seem obvious, please consult with your healthcare professionals regarding your diabetes management. It's important. Please understand that this project is highly experimental and is not FDA approved for therapy. Therefore, you take full responsibility for building and running the system and do so at your own risk. So if you are looping, just kind of nod to yourself and say, yes, I take full responsibility. And I'm going to make a, two separate announcements today that I don't normally do. Uh, this is a strong recommendation for everyone who is looping. So if you are looping happily, and I assume you are, it's a great idea to check in to SoCal Loopers for critical updates. It's not enough to do it once a year. There's some interesting updates are going on. The most recent had to do with the time change. Um, so please check in as often as you think might be smart. And then to make it a little bit easier, please set your Facebook SoCal Loopers notifications to highlights. So notifications is right underneath the uh, picture of SoCal Loopers and it'll say notifications, go on there and click on highlights, which will notify you of when you're mentioned and important announcements. And finally, if you haven't heard us yet, if you have not migrated your Night Scout to Atlas and you use Night Scout, you have, I believe it's nine days left before all your history will disappear and you won't be able to, to retrieve that. There are plenty of good videos out there. We've done a couple of help events. Uh, ask us if you are lost, please do not wait until November 10th to do it because all our admins are gonna be very busy helping everybody. So if you can make sure you're up and running before you need to or until the deadline. So I would like to introduce you to Dr. Bruce Buckingham. He is professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Endocrinology and Diabetes at Stanford University School of Medicine. And for those of you who don't know, that's in California. It's a beautiful area. Um, his research focuses on continuous glucose monitoring and the development of a closed loop system or artificial pancreas. He has served as principal investigator on the following, and this is just a limited group. Stanford on the JDRF Multi-Center Continuous Glucose Monitoring CGM Study, Medtronic 670G Hybrid Closed Loop System, Ed Damiano and Islet and the Bionic Pancreas, several NIH Multi-Center Collaborative Studies, testing in-home closed loop control with Roman Vorka, who we heard from last week, University of Virginia and Type 0 Algorithm, and then there are a bunch more. There's Bigfoot Biomedical, Tandem Diabetes, Animus, which is no longer, Insulet, uh, RPI, which is Rensselaer Polytechnic, which was a rival of my college uh, for the development of closed loop systems. Uh, his team is also developing, and this is interesting, pay attention here, long-term insulin infusion sets as part of the direct net. He's also doing long-term log longitudinal studies of MRI and neurocognitive changes in children with diabetes relating to changes in their glycemic control as measured by A1C and CGM. That's a whole lot. And I could spend the whole hour telling you about uh, Dr. Buckingham, but I'm going to let him tell you himself. Dr. Buckingham, thank you so very much. We're very excited. Welcome. Well, thank you. That was a great introduction. I can't remember half of what you, of the projects you mentioned. So <laughs> go from there. But um, I want to thank everyone for making it through Halloween. And the concept of migrating before November 4th is interesting and maybe a good thing to do. So <laughs> migrate if you need to, um, uh, or feel concerned too. Um, I, I've looked at a number of, uh, of these presentations and they, they've been really amazing that you guys have put on. And I, I, some had slides and went through a set of slides and, and went through things like that. And others were more casual and answering questions and, and chatting and, and seeing what your concerns were. And I'm 
going to disclose from, from the beginning that most of my work is focused on um, closed loop systems. And, and they started, you know, in the hospital with um, IVs to, to document the health accuracy and safety. And then we moved to Airbnbs and diabetes camps and hotels and, and then to outpatient studies. And um, I have not done a lot with loop. And I, I've had a number of patients migrate or, or volunteer for these clinical research studies we do and, and come off loop and, and do that. And I work with Rehan Lau, who was here, I think, one or two weeks ago. And he was a, a fellow with us and now is on faculty here at Stanford. And uh, he is very involved in, in loop. I'm on the, uh, an advisory board for loop, but I don't know how much I can say or disclose, and I think you guys know a lot more about Loop than I do. So I, I'm not gonna go into great detail on, on Loop, but I'm happy to answer questions on the other systems. Um, I, uh, I thought, I, I do have some slides and I can sort of start out with those and see if they're, if they're of interest and then move on to, to other things. Um, I think it's, this has been an amazing year. It's really dramatically changed healthcare. I mean, we really have been doing virtual visits, having continuous glucose monitoring and really being able to assess control with that and not relying on an A1C has just been a game changer. Um, I still miss um, the physical contact and, and seeing someone in person. Um, but on the other hand, when you do these, it's like a home visit. I mean, I, I can see everyone's room houses back there and you see the kids and the cats and, and it's, uh, it's like being an old time doctor, you know, going in and, and meeting the family. So uh, sometimes young kids that can't be contained in the background. So it's, it's always, uh, I think it has actually in a lot of ways been, been very neat and it saves people a lot of time. I'm not going to cover all this, but it's just some I, things I wanted to bring up that, um, uh, and I, I sort of mentioned the, the home visits and, and the decrease in need for A1C tests. It's like going from, from uh, to non-injunctive use in, in CGM monitoring. All of a sudden, the finger sticks are gone. And we do A1C in a finger stick now, so that's pretty uh, easy. Um, we've, it's been an incredible year, and now we have the election in, in a couple of days. And I think one of the things that's come up in, in healthcare is also the health disparities are being highlighted that uh, minorities have higher A1Cs, they have lower rates of using pumps and CGM and closed loop. And I actually think there's an unconscious bias amongst healthcare physicians to take someone who seems to be technologically savvy and offer them these things and not provide it to someone that's having trouble finger sticking or bolusing. So if they don't finger stick, they don't get a CGM. If they don't bolus, they don't get a pump. And if they aren't doing either, they aren't offered much. And it's, uh, in fact, they're told they're sort of miserable people managing their diabetes. And, and they come into a visit and it's often a pretty negative experience. So um, I've had a couple of those that have uh, young men, 19, 20, 21 years old, that we've put in our close-up studies and they haven't been on CGM, haven't been on a pump, been trying to get on it for years and, and it just never got through the system. And we're sort of down in the mouth and um, it was just a game changer. All of a sudden their diabetes was in control. They came in with A1Cs around nine and a half, 10. And, in, and when they were on the systems, their A1s were seven and a half, 7.3, 7.6 in that range. And they were getting a good night's sleep. Uh, they, were, they were still missing about two out of every four boluses each day, but the, the system would cover for that and, and manage it. And so they, uh, they really had a, such a tremendously light step when they came in, they were just different people. They completely changed their sense of self and who they were. And instead of someone being beaten down by this, they, they, they really fell on top of it and they could be proud about it. And it was, it was, it was amazing to see. And I, I think we really need to try in the healthcare system to get over our biases. And 
the people that should, the first people to go on a closed loop system are the people with an A1C that are 10 or 12. They're going to have always received the biggest benefit and are going to have the biggest drop and the biggest improvement and the biggest decrease in long-term risk. And they're going to feel better day to day. So I, I think that's something that is really important. And I'm one of those people that feel that healthcare should be a right and not a privilege. Uh, it's a, uh, everyone should have access and they should all have access to what they need. So um, this is just something that they did in our uh, clinic, just looking at miles, uh, travel time and costs to come to a clinic visit and all that was saved by telehealth. So it, it is a savings, not only in time, but actually in, in money. Um, I think one of the things that's interested me is what's been going on with COVID. And if you look at people, this was a study out of Italy um, that came into the hospital, not into the ICU, but onto the hospital ward. And they defined them as being hyperglycemic if they had a glucose above 140. They asked them to enroll in a study where they would get intensive insulin management or standard of care. And the standard of care ran average glucose is around 180, 200 in that range. And the intensive care significantly lowered their glucose values. And um, they were treated with IV insulin, 60% were, uh, and to keep their glucose between 140 and 180. Not a very tight target, but between 140 and 180. And these are um, mostly type twos. Um, and this is what happened to survival. This is if they controlled the glucose, it was about a 90% survival. And if they didn't, it was about a 40% survival. And this is if you had diabetes when you came in, about a 95% survival. If you didn't have diabetes, and if you did, it was around a 55% survival. So these are striking numbers related to glucose control. And um, th this is uh, another subset of that, but it's the same data. And in the hospitals, there are no closed-up systems. They have, do not offer closed-up systems. Diabetes is managed on the general hospital wards by the sliding scale, which is, I think, an archaic method where you look at uh, the glucose value and give a scale for how much insulin to give based on what the glucose is, it's unrelated to how much you eat. So you can eat a few carbs or a lot of carbs, small meal, big meal, it doesn't make any difference. It's just based on the glucose. And then the next day they come back and they look how well you did with that sliding scale value and they raise it or lower it or keep it the same looking at a value three, four hours later. So it's based on finger sticks before meals and, and unrelated to, to your food intake. And, it's, and that's why you have an average glucose of 200 <laughs> if you put them on a sensor. Their average glucoses are, are well above 200 a lot of times. So this is, um, as you all know in this group, the pod, whoops, flip sides. And one of the nice things about it uh, in the horizon system, you know, this is the Dexcom, it's talking directly to the pod uh, and as long as these are on your body and in communication, you're in closed loop. You don't need anything in, in between. And the pod is disposable in three days. And the Dexcom is disposable if you need to throw a transmitter away in, in 10 days if someone's in the hospital. So now you have a system that you can put into a room that where you need isolation. And one of the problems, I mean, at Stanford, about a month ago, we ran out of large N95 masks. And then this last few weeks, there's been a shortage on small N95 masks. And going every time you go in to do a finger stick, you gotta put in all this protective gear and then change it when you go to the next patient's room. Every time you do a blood test all, all through the day. So it's a huge, uh, you know, expense and loss of uh, personal protective equipment, which has been uh, in short supply. So it, we can manage their diabetes with this on the patient and, and the PDM outside the room. 
and you can give the boluses and you can read the CGM. The nursing station can see the CGM data and you can give boluses to them. So I, I think this is a potential way. And with this, we could bring their glucoses down and cover and decrease the, the respiratory, going on a respirator, uh, mortality, going to the ICU from 80% down to about 30%. So I've been working on this. I'm with the group. Um, I, in the next hour, I've got to respond to uh, the FDA. We're submitting it to the FDA to try and get this going. And I, so I think that's um, something that's uh, important. Um, and it's an area where you don't normally get it. And if one of you gets sick and you go in the hospital, you're gonna have a bureaucratic battle to keep your loop going. And particularly if you get <laughs> on, on, on a unit where they're used to, uh, to giving sliding scale therapy. And, I, I, and we are, we're working very hard to make guidelines to make sure people can wear their closed loop systems, but you should talk to your healthcare provider and make sure they're gonna fight for you and, and make sure you can wear it in there if you wanna wear it and, and to make sure they're gonna accept it. And particularly with loop because it isn't even FDA approved. So there may be hospital issues with that. So you'll have to sign some waivers. And I think FTR Hospital has a waiver form. We're developing waiver forms for people to, people to sign so they can continue to uh, be in closed loop in the hospital. But it isn't something the nurses on the floor are trained on. So the hospital, because they haven't trained the nurses, really can't um, take any liability for it. Okay. So, um, anyway, I... Um, there are a lot of inpatient advantages that I think I just went over them. This is the outpatient study, very good user acceptance. See, the other thing I thought, which is a little off topic and everyone's on pod here, but for people that used to be on infusion sets uh, you know, that were connected with tubing, um, there really hasn't been much of an improvement in that technology Oh, well, probably in 30 years. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's been pretty much the same stuff. Um, Sherties, quick set, silhouettes. Um, they, we, I did these studies and, and these are different age. And they're, you know, in the 20, 20 year olds in general, pretty reasonable control. And I compared Novolog to Humalog, steel to Teflon, whether it was in lipohypertrophy, non-lipohypertrophy, and whether we used hyaluronidase or not. And I asked them to wear their infusion sets for seven days. And um, we use silhouettes here because we wanted to stain the infusion sac and look at insulin precipitation in the tubing. And as you can see in general, if you're using like a quick set, uh, about a third, 30 to 40% will last seven days on these. And generally the major cause is hyperglycemia. You begin to get unexplained hyperglycemia. And you're giving correction doses and it doesn't work well. Some are removed for pain or they look red. Uh, about two, 3% actually have an infection. And then there's um, the accidental pullout, the tubing on the door handle, uh, tubing uh, when you're dropping the pants or um, um, I had, one lady who was uh, expecting a, a hot date and she took, took the, the infusion set off. So a number of reasons why they do it. But what we've done is we did a modified infusion set that has been developed um, at Medtronic. And we, we presented this at, at, at uh, ATTD, you know, I think diabetes, the ADA meeting. Yeah, we did it ADA too this year. And with this modified cap, it has a little cap in it with a little uh, filter in the top of it where it attaches to the cartridge. The tubing has been modified and um, the rest of it's pretty much, and the tape's been modified. So it'll last um, seven days. And we, um, we got about 80% to last seven days which is pretty good. And compared to a quick set where we got about 40%. And um, this is the survival analysis. This is um, how they, there was no difference between whether heparin was around or not. So we just you know, combined this data. But um, 
what I want to say. One of the um, pain, discomfort, hyperglycemia is, is the main reason. I don't want to go into all these details. And one of the interesting things was they were very comfortable. People had much less pain. They noticed much less pump bumps and irritation around the site. So Medtronic is completing a, um, oh, I'm in a room. Can you still see me? The, the lights just went out here, just one second. Well, that's a first for us. <laughs> well, it's a room with a motion sensor. So, <laughs> so um, it's a clean study and uh, several hundred people were in it for three months, so 12 weeks for each person. And um, so that's gonna be analyzed and, and hopefully that'll be available. So that would be a change. And just, I, I put these slides together uh, this morning and I don't know exactly how accurate they are, but I, some of the questions asked me, what are the differences in, in adjusting a basal rate with, with tandem with, and, and the Medtronics are using the 780, not the, the 670. Uh, so it's, it'll be their new advanced one coming out and Insulet, and that'll be in the Horizon uh, closed loop system and with the bionic uh, pancreas. And um, I may be wrong. If there's anything I say about loop that's wrong, you guys let me know. Um, but in tandem, the basal rate is set by the user and changes in the basal rate will affect how the controller works. So if you tend to be running higher, you can increase the basal rate and it will make a difference. And if you're tending to running lower, it uh, you, you know, you, you can back off on it. And uh, if you are in your predicted, if you're in the zone, it's, a, it's you know, it's a uh, uh, zone controller. So if you're in your 80 to 160 range, it will be using your program basal. And it only begins its basal control when you're outside of, of that zone. Um, the Metronic is initially set by the user um, but then once, once you get into closed loop, it's looking at your, um, your total daily insulin dose based on a fading memory over about six days. So it's constantly updating. So we had kids in that study that ended up being in there for three years and they were going through puberty. And if you looked at the program basal rates in the pump, if you didn't update them, they were getting a lot more basal as they went through puberty as their insulin requirements increased. And the system just automatically did that, which was, which was nice. Um, I, I think the basal rate can be programmed in the loop, but I don't think it's an adaptive basal rate. Um, in tandem, the basal rate is not adaptive. In insulet, the basal rate adapts with every pod change. So every time you change a pod, it takes the information of your insulin requirements from, from those three days and then updates the controller with your, your insulin needs. Um, that bionic pancreas has a controller for basal insulin requirements and it adapts pretty quickly. A lot of the adaptation occurs over 15 hours to 24 hours. So. If someone gets into a lot of insulin resistance, it will adapt and ramp up the insulin needs pretty quickly. And um, if, again, if they become more sensitive, it will back off pretty quickly. Okay. Bruce, is that the um, dual hormone or is that the single? Single hormone. hormone. This is the insulin only. It's, it's the first one that's gonna get approved, but actually that's true for both of them. It, I mean, the, 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 um, the insulin delivery has that, adaptation built into it for basal. So the, the bionic pancreas has three controllers, one for basal needs, one for correction requirements, and uh, one for meals. Okay. And they're all adaptive. And, and this does not also cover a, a tide pool loop? I, I am not uh, I'm not going to talk about tight pool loop. I'm, I'm just putting in what I sort of uh, am aware of. And if I'm wrong on any of this, you let me know. Okay. Because um, that hasn't been completely finalized yet. Okay. Um, loop. Um, 
in insulin action time, you have four or five different profiles. You can go from FIAS to an older one uh, uh, by John many years ago. So you can have a duration of action somewhere around four to six hours. Tandem uses an insulin action time of about five hours. Metronic has in, in this new pump, you can adjust the insulin active time anywhere from two to six hours. And if you use it two hours, you get really good control. And it really adapts quickly. If someone misses a meal bolus or is late in bolusing or has a meal rise, and, and they were getting uh, close to 80% when they used a two hour active insulin time. And there was no increase in hypoglycemia when they did that. So if, if you get the new one, I, I, I've been putting all our kids on, on the two hours and getting, getting good results with that. Insula uses a insulin active time of between three to four hours and it's adjusting that um, by, by an algorithm and seeing sort of what someone's insulin requirement, you know, need, how long their insulin seems to be acting and adjusting it to somewhere between three to four hours. Uh, bionic pancreas, I was sort of looking for that. I'm not sure I found it. They initially had a, <laughs> in their very initial study, it was very quick on and off insulin action and it, and it was too quick. And I think they moved it so it's more like a four or five hour, certainly a three, four hour. <clears throat> but I, I couldn't find my, my reference on that. Uh, looking at target glucoses in loop, I think that range is adjustable by the user and you can have an upper lower on it. In tandem, it's based on, you know, um, it, it's a model predictive control and it's a treat to range. And the range during the day is uh, 112 to 160. The night should be on a lower line there. And the night, it lowers over four or five hours down to a target of 112, 120 in the morning. With the Metronic, with the new one, your target can be 100 or 120. And uh, then there's a 150 target for exercise, which can be a, a temp target. The, you get about a couple percent, somewhere around two, four percent improvement in time and range going from 120 to 100. Um, Insula, you can adjust the target at, in 10 milligram inc increments. You can go 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, and you can vary it through the day. So you can have a profile. If you, want, if you feel pretty good with what's happening at night, you can keep someone at 110. If you have a toddler going off to school and you want to run them a little bit higher to make sure they don't get low, you could put it up to 120, 130 during the day. So you can have a profile for target glucose that varies by time of the day. Uh, which, which is, I think, a nice feature. Um, for bionic pancreas, the target glucose is the default of 120, and we'll have a range of about 110 to 130. They don't want to state that, so I'm going to go that quickly. Um, tan, the, um, with exercise, there are these overrides that you can set uh, to uh, adjust the... Um, basal insulin sensitivity factor and carb ratios, all is sort of a, a percent change when, when you're exercising and you can have it for different activities and you can have your little icon, what activity you're doing and, and set those up uh, uh, for your exercise. And I, I think that's really neat. Uh, Tandem has a target uh, which uh, goes to, instead of their um, 112, 0.5 to 160, it goes 140 to 160. Instead of stopping basal at 70, it'll stop it at 80. Uh, but the corrections continue if you're predicted to be above 180. So if you're exercising, if you take carbs before exercise, that can trigger an insulin delivery. And if you get low when you're exercising and you take carbs, that can trigger insulin delivery and you can sort of get a uh, oscillation going on there. So you need to take smaller amounts of carbs or uh, leave auto mode go and put in a temp based stall or something like that in manual mode. Medtronic has a temp target of 150 and it has a duration where you can set the duration for it to turn off. With tandem, it doesn't have a duration. So when you turn it on, you gotta remember to manually turn it off. The, um, all of them, if you're changing the target or going into it are best done at least an hour before you start exercise. The things are always much more effective if they're done an hour ahead of time. 
Uh, with Inslet, they have a target when, for exercise of 150, but during, it's called hypoprotect with them. Um, and all the insulin, the basal bolus and corrections are de decreased uh, by about 50%. And you can set a duration on that for anywhere from one to 72 hours. You can set it up for three days if you wanted it to. If for some reason you were doing something that you're really worried about. You know, bionic pancreas doesn't really have an exercise function. So um, you, 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 you just need to um, be, be careful with the amount of carbs you take before you exercise or, or again, go into open loop. The correction factors um, in loop, I believe, are set by the user. In tandem, um, the correction factors are set by the user. Um, the auto correction, when it's giving auto corrections, which you can do every hour, the um, correction factor is based on taking your total daily insulin dose, which is based upon a fading memory over six days, and then dividing that into 1500 or 1800, somewhere in that region. Um, for user, Bolus's, um, if you change their correction factors, that will affect it. If, you're, if you yourself are giving a correction dose or putting a correction in with a meal, it's whatever you programmed into it. So you have control over your correction factors for manual bolus, boluses, but for the auto boluses, it's using this 1500 to 1800 rule. Medtronic uses an 1800 rule divided by your total daily dose. And that's again, based on a, a fading memory over about six days. Um, insulin um, is the correction doses are determined by the user. So if you, whatever you programmed in for your correction doses, it will use those for correction doses. And again, the bionic pancreas has an algorithm to determine correction doses. And so it looks at how you, how you re re did and responded to a correction dose and then it's constantly adapting that. Um, loop has, uh, I believe, a reverse correction. Uh, tandem uh, doesn't really, Medtronic has a safe bolus, where if you low or predicted to get low, it will cut back on the bolus, or your ability to give a bolus. And insulin has a reverse correction also, but you can toggle it off. Um, I think Loop uses your rate of change if you're using the momentum effect because it's looking at the acute rate of change and where your glucose is going and calculating uh, doses. Tandem, uh, I don't think uses the uh, rate of change. It uses the glucose from the sensor, but not the rate of change in deciding doses. Medtronic uh, doesn't, Insulet does, uh, and it incorporates the rate of change into the bolus. And then extended boluses. Um, I think in a sense, you're getting that when you put in the carb duration, the type of meal, you know, the lollipop, the taco, or the, uh, you know, pizza, it's, it's going to, that's sort of opening your algorithm up for how long you expect the, the meal to go on. With tandem, you can do sort of the standard um, dual wave where you're giving a two hour extended bolus. Metronic and insulin, when you're in closed loop, you can't give extended boluses. So I'm going to stop with that little comparison and, uh, <clears throat> and see what is on, what's on people's minds. And I can, uh, I don't know if this raised okay. more questions than it's worth, or, but uh, that's how I started out. Then the guillotine, I always listen to it. <laughs> Some people still remember the old guillotine and these pumps. And uh, there we go. But I, the reason I show, I know oh, this is the, uh, I just really want to point out that there was a lot of this going on, this um, non-enzymatic glycosylation. This is, when these kids were around, when I was at camp, this is camp in, in the uh, uh, mid, late 70s. And they, they had what was called uh, sclerodermal-like changes, thick and tight skin. They get joint contractures of the hands. This was called the prayer sign. And when you got that, it was also occurring 
all through your body, in your kidneys, on your glomerular basement membrane, in all the collagen in your body, the, the, around your blood vessels. And this is at camp, 50% uh, had this. 20% had some decrease in their vital capacity, 17% had joint contractures. I actually, in several had two or three joint contractures. And it's just not enzymatic by constellation. And this is normal skin collagen. And this is a biopsy of, of their skin collagen, very thickened and hyalinized and built up. And the thing is the half-life of basement membrane collagen is 15 years. And that's why it takes about 15 years to see changes. And if you make things better, um, you're, you're, you're gonna see it, you get an improvement in 15 years. So, um, and this is just the DCCT looking at A1C, which is a measure of your risk of non-enzymatic glycosylation. And this is the classic of, of A1C levels in 2015 here. But, um, and this is when we put CGM on kids, you know, you, before you did four finger sticks at breakfast, they look great at lunch. They look great. And at dinner, they look great. And this was, and no one knew what was happening in between. And that's why we got all those problems. And th you mentioned the um, MRI and brain studies. And I, I just want to point out the major changes we saw were all related to hyperglycemia and not to hypoglycemia. We didn't see anything that correlated with hypoglycemia in these changes. And then there was this British study, with, um, Swedish study, which I hope you're all aware of, but this is looking at kids they followed in Sweden. And they actually have, have a uh, organized healthcare. They have a national health service. So they actually take care of all their children and adults uh, with diabetes and they have a registry and they can track them and see what goes on. Uh, something we can't do. And this is following them for eight to nine years, 10 to 11, 12 to 13, 14 to 15, 16 to 20 years. And this is looking at A1C levels. And when you look at an A1C of 6.5, there's nothing. There aren't any complications. At around seven, there's really nothing. It isn't until you get to an A1C of around 8.6% and you follow them for about 20 years, 15, 20 years, you've seen a five, 10% risk of any problems. So it's dramatically different today than the old story of what we were seeing. I just wanna make everyone aware of that. We've, um, and, and, and how important it is to get into this range, but actually with, with closed loop studies, getting into this range is relatively easy. Even people that are missing boluses are gonna be able to get here at a seven. So, so I wanted to bring that up. Okay, uh, I don't want to get into all this. Well, uh, Bruce, the chat has been very active with questions if you're able to take some. I, 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 I thought I might stir myself a pot of trouble here. <laughs> um, so I th I, I'd like to do them in reverse order, so most recent first, because that will probably cover things that were uh, on the most recent slides. So one of the last questions was, do you have a favorite up-and-coming system? You know, the great thing is I think they're all getting better, and each one offers unique things that are going to be unique to given individuals. I think uh, Medtronic has gotten rid of a lot of their alarms. It used to be seven or eight a day and they're, they're down to two or three a day and most of those are for sensors. They're, um, so they've learned a lot from the first time. They're, um, they are probably the most aggressive one with the, the target of 100 and, and the short active insulin time. You can get uh, pretty good control. You can miss meal boluses and do very well with them. I mean, the study we're doing is to have kids um, miss a dinner bolus and then take one and a half times their usual dinner bolus and miss a bolus with that and just mm. see how well the controller does it. And a lot of times the parents are totally amazed at how well the, the system handled it. So I, I'm, I've been happy with that. It's a tethered pump. 
that when they get their non-adjunctive use and, and they get a sensor that's a no-cal sensor uh, and, and, a blue, and the pump will have Bluetooth so it can talk to phones and be remote, I, th I think they will have overcome a lot of the initial barriers, that, barriers they had with their system. Well, I that, I, I'm actually going to skip back to an earlier question, but um, have there have there been some improvements in the Medsonic sensors? I mean, many of us have used Guardians and N lights in the past, and virtually, I think almost everyone that's looping is uh, is looping with Dexcom. Oh, okay, right, right, yeah, absolutely, and they require you know the calibration. So I I think that is the number one thing on their table right now is to get that sensor to non-adjunctive use and, and in a range that qualifies it to be uh, an you know, interchangeable sensor to be used in closed loop systems. So it, it has to meet the criteria that uh, Dexcom has met. So, um, so one, uh, one user uh, asked why the target ranges were so high. Of course, many of us in loop are using target ranges of like, you know, 90 to 100 or 95 to 100, things like that. So uh, I think some of the people think the target ranges are a little high in the, um, in the future commercially available systems than even the commercially available systems that are already out. Right. And, and I think that say um, uh, people, I, I must say, I think a number of the loopers are super users. There are people that really know their diabetes, they're watching the carbs, they're, they're counting well, they're, they're really on top of it. And um, when you're offering these things, Ed, Ed Damiano, like for the bionic pancreas, he wants to make that available to anyone where you could remotely put them up on it. You, you could, you know, there's, the only thing you put in that is the patient's weight. There are no carb ratios, there's no correction factors. There's no basal insulin. There's nothing like that. You just put in the weight and get going. There's it's no carb. There's no carb counting. It's just you know usual size, much bigger, much smaller meals. And so it's trying to make it easier, and still not increase the risk of hypoglycemia. So people that may not be, if if you set your target to eighty to ninety. Um, you're, you're potentially at a higher risk for hypoglycemia unless you're, you're really, you know, sort of watching those meals and carbs. And if you have something that's automatically, and, and I think the, the next thing is actually to get the, the fully automated closed loop control. So well, you and, the, have to count carbs. and the one thing you do have to remember with loop is, yes, yes. So for putting a time in of, you know, 95 to hundred uh, loop is still always looking at that you know, pretty much being at the end of the insulin curve. So in six hours, so it's, you know, it's not, it's not really as, as tight as I think some people might think. Um, uh, you were talking a little bit of, on that one slide where you had all the different um, systems mm -hmm. uh, and you were talking about um, the duration of insulin and changing it on the Medtronic. Did that actually um, like what type of time and range of, uh, what, what percentage of time and range were you getting on that system? And was it ultimately uh, better uh, than, the, than the other ones with that, um, with that two hour uh, DGIA time? Yeah, so this is you know, the difference between the two. Let me put this full screen maybe. So th this is the overall group and they switched them from a hundred to 120 and 120 to 100 um, in this uh, crossover study. Um, this is some of our kids that were on it. But if you used a two to three hour active insulin time, um, your time in range um, was about 76%. When you put it to two hours at 100, it was 79% time in range, which I know for loopers, you say, well, that's nothing. Um, but th these were uh, the full population from you know 14 on up, um, and so it's it's not bad. And at a 120, uh, if you're at two hours, you run around 75% time in range. When you put the set point down to 100, it gets to 79% time in range. And and again, you also get a three uh, percent drop just lowering the uh, time. The automotive um, exits were significantly reduced. This is from Bergenstall. So it, it, I think it 
it does make a difference. And um, our, our families have been pretty happy with it. So I, I was just bringing up Medtronic because it's certainly um, been uh, beaten uh, to death for a long time. <laughs> and uh, and that, they, that there is a, a new generation. I think the- Yeah, it's kind of interesting because they were first to the market, but then the uh, not super fast on innovating. <laughs> yeah, they were the first sensor out commercially too. Uh, they, um, so they, they were first there too. And, and it takes, they, they've been taking a beating. The, so um, um, there was the, a one sort of set of questions um, but yeah, I didn't I just, answer your pump question, which was- Oh, yeah, sorry. I recommend. Yeah. Let me just go back to that. So I think um, I, I, I really like insulet. I like the patch pump. I like your enclosed loop. When you're on it, it's, it's working all the time. We're, we're looking at the swimmers and seeing, because Bluetooth isn't supposed to work in water, but our swimmers are saying it's working for them. So that's sort of interesting. You could be a marathoner or a triathlete. You're not a, but, but, but I think someone that's doing swimming and-, and maintain closed loop while you're doing it. That's, uh, and as I say, it has a lot of, of potential. A lot of people like, like a pod and not having the, the, the tube on them. And, and we got really good control. We had the very low incidence of hypoglycemia with that system. I, I mean, very low. The less than 70 was like one, 2%. One, it, was, mm. it was really, really amazing. I don't know whether I have it here. Dun, dun, dun. But you look at the less than 70, 0. 0.3, 0. 0.5 at, at a target of 110, 0.5%. And free range at home where they could choose whatever target they wanted, it was still uh, less than 1%. And the percent less than 54 was essentially zero. So that's uh, with a, a time and range of uh, 74, 72, 74%. So that, that's not bad. Uh, so I, I think they're getting good control and, and it's safe. Um, the, um, so, um, that, and then if you go to bionic pancreas, I mean, it, it just has so many in, in terms of the user, user interface and what it's doing, you know, not, not having to count carbs, not having to tinker with everything, not having to, to, to mess with anything because it's always adapting to you and, and learning you. And I, I think that's uh, very powerful and, and something that can appeal to a broad population. So I, I think all of them, um, and in tandem control IQ, you know, very few alarms, pretty, again, a loopers probably would be upset that the targets aren't lower and would wanna put them down to, to 90, but it very safely takes care of people, gives them good night's sleep and, and it's been a game changer for uh, for many of my adolescents. So, and what's interesting about uh, the uh, just going to go back to the the two hours of duration of insulin time. It's uh, on the Medtronic. It seems like it's almost like what people are doing with Control IQ and leaving in sleep mode all the time. It's like sort of a little trickery. Do you know why it works or or? Uh, well, I think it opens up the algorithm. algorithm to because it gets rid of active insulin pretty quickly so when it's giving correction doses and adjusting things it can it, it allows it to be more aggressive but on the other hand the safety all of them have a safety component to them to prevent hypoglycemia that's one of the prime drivers in these algorithms is not driving someone low and so that safety mechanism still prevents them from getting low in that system so the incidence of hypoglycemia was not higher when you shut the active insulin time down, which would normally be your concern. But the, the safety module prevented that. Dr. Buckingham, uh, what if, if so many people like to not have tubing and you're finding that it works well, why aren't there more patch or pods on the market? And what about micro needle systems? Yeah. So I, I think everyone has um, seen that as a potential place to go. Um, it's, um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, Medtronic's been saying they were going to have a patch pump for probably 12 years, I think, I, that I've heard it. And, and they, they, so they've had different 
prototypes they were working on and they just have never come out with one. Um, I, I think there will, Tandem is going to have their, their sort of sport pump, which is going to be very close to a, a patch pump, very, very small. Um, sort of, it, it'll be completely controlled by, by a phone or a remote device. So it is, it is like, a, like a pod in that sense. Uh, it will have the ability to put algorithms and things like that on it. So I think it's going, and that will be, have a very short piece of tethering, but you can put the, the, the pump on you. And so they, they will have a version coming out. Okay. So I think there's, there is a future uh, for that, but it, you're, you're right. Um, Do you know whatever happened to the Solo that Roche bought? Because they did have FDA approval. Yeah. <laughs> I did. <laughs> It, yeah, it just, <laughs> you never heard anything more, right? <laughs> right. Um, back on uh, cannulas, uh, have you heard anything on capillary biomedical and what's happened with their uh, quest? Yes, I, I think it's moving ahead. They, they're doing clinical studies in Australia and um, moving along with them. And once they... Uh, get finished. I, the plan is to do studies in the U.S. and, and seek FDA approval. So they they are moving ahead. And do you know of any other cannula projects? Well, I, I mean, there are a couple little. Um, all the infusion sets are are really um, made uh, from. Um, Unimedical, it used to be called Unimedical. I, they, they were bought, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Um, but they, uh, they have been working on a lantern infusion set, which we tested and it worked well. It, it has um, uh, little slits at the, the tip so that if the tip gets excluded, the insulin can go out mm, the, right, the, side. the sides. Yeah. And, and that worked well for, we had them wear that for, 10 days and about 80% wore it the, for, at seven days. It was functioning well at mm. seven days. So that's um, another one that, that's going down the road. Um, I, I don't know if you know it, but on the pods on your cannula, if you shine them up into the light, there's actually, they've been drilled through from side to side with a little laser beam. So actually insulin can go out each of the, so you have essentially, if the tip gets secluded, insulin will go out on, on these side ports. And it's really cut down the incidence of occlusions in, in their product. So you just, I, I don't know if you, you guys all knew that already, I guess. No, but we're going to be looking tonight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, well, it I'm was gonna, in Canada. I, I think they've done it in the U.S. too, but it was, it's certainly been introduced to Canada and in the, in the, Infusion sets we're using. So you need to shine sort of a light and hit it just right. And you can, it's a little tiny, tiny hole. And obviously the 780G is now on the market, but uh, the, um, what else is, what is in phase three that's really close right now that you know of? Phase, well, yeah, phase like three. a phase three clinical trial. Like, so the sort of the last, the last step. Well, I, I mean, Insula is, completed their trial and, and presenting to the FDA should package should go out in the next few weeks, probably. Ah, so I think the FDA is a little behind because of COVID. So it might be not the usual three months, maybe six months. So that would be like March or April, April for them probably. And the bionic pancreas um, study is a big study. It's like 400 subjects. And we just completed the, uh, pilot study on that and that should get started in two weeks and is a you know so six month study and m many sites starting you got to collect all the data and get it submitted to the FDA so these things are are in in process and the the we've made it all the way back to the beginning now so the first questions related were all three related to um dual hormone and um uh, Amlin and things like that. Uh, do you know where that's uh, sort of going now or is it going anywhere? Yeah, I think that's really interesting stuff. And first of all, I, I think I might 
show you. Um, I, 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 this is one that I, I've been talking about a little bit. I just thought I'd bring it up. Um, and that's uh, using accelerators, heart rate monitors, and Clue. Have any of you used Clue? Go Clue. Uh, no. I have no clue. <laughs> okay. So Clue was an app developed by an engineer at Stanford, and their company is uh, Go is Clue. The uh, if you Google it, it's Go Clue, and it um, it detects if you're eating. And so, mm. oh, okay. if you take two or three gestures to your mouth, it will say, "Are you eating?" And we had it for adolescents. Have you bullets? And it was this little alert that would run up there. And it could also go to the parent. It could text the parent and, um, or you could snooze it. And, um, um, and you can also say you're treating a hypo or you're eating, but you aren't putting eating carbs in the meal. And that could text the parent. Uh, Julia started eating, responded, yes, bolus. And so if the parent sees the glucose going up, they'll know they bolus. Or if they're getting low, they could give a text and let them know they treated. So we randomized uh, about 19 kids who were missing some of their meal boluses. And um, their A1C at baseline was 8.3, which is what happens when you miss boluses. And it, it was a crossover study and um, they had a half percent reduction in A1C down to 7.8, just having this, mm. this uh, reminder. So I thought that was good. And um, if you look at what happens, if you look at this, this is where Clue recognized someone had 23 bytes. So th this, is, this is a watch and you know, uh, eating, have you bolus, you're having a hypo. And you can text your parent and say, I just snooze. Yes, I was treating a low. So they don't have to bug in the class. And this is the a half percent drop. And uh, this is sort of an example. This is where Clue detected eating. And um, here's another time they detected eating with 38 bytes. And if you had an algorithm to try and detect the onset of eating, you would need, it would probably fire off here, which is about 18 minutes before you could detect it on a sensor. And here, this person began eating again. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong. Uh, let me see. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not hitting the right part on the screen. At any rate, maybe I, I go down. Anyway, it's, it's about 12, 18 minutes ahead of someone eating. So now you have something you can detect. Oh, now I got all my slides going. So you can detect, and, and the lights went off in my room. So this is, uh, you can detect um, someone eating ahead of time. You could give a bolus on that. Not a huge bolus, but you can give uh, like a pre-meal bolus. And then when you see the glucose going up, you have a second confirmation they've eaten. And then you can really begin to deliver a lot more insulin and really cover a meal. And if you did that, I think you could have a full closed loop and you just need to wear this watch. This was, this detected about 90, it, it, you had two to three false positives a, uh, a week, roughly. So about, it detected about 95% of the meals with a very low false positive rate of time someone was eating. So I, I think it has um, promise. And I, uh, what happened last year is when we, I was working with her, we presented it and she presented it to JDRF and to Tandem and Insulet and um, Medtronic and no one seemed interested in it. So uh, I, I think that's gonna be, by the way, they, they say it picks up the difference between water and wine. 80%, whether you're drinking water or wine. Oh, that's turn my light on. I just jumped onto the app store so we can download this. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I got to wave my arms every half hour. Yeah. Uh, okay. We have another, another um, 
this group seems to be really fixed on cannulas tonight, uh, which probably is a little unusual. You're probably used to getting asked more about questions about technology than cannulas. But um, uh, cannulas uh, is where the rubber hits the road. They're yeah. really important. So uh, the, this particular set of discussions has talked about uh, a lot of us running out of real estate uh, because we've had T1 for so long and, uh, and having uh, scar tissue and things like that. Uh, have there been some studies or suggestions for uh, those of us running out of real estate? Yeah, I, I, I think part of it is just finding sites. And, and I think some of the things that auto insert, like, like the Omnipod actually open up more areas where you could go to backsides and different areas where you might not normally, you know, have the manual skills to, to insert something. So that, yeah, so the, the, the over the shoulder tricks. Yeah. Th those sort of stuff. So you, you get more area that way. I think um, the other thing, like, with this Medtronic system, we're seeing less inflammation at the site despite wearing it for seven or eight days. And so if there's less, I mean, you can wear a sensor, as you know, I, I had an engineer wear a Dexcom for a couple months and that used, you know, people used to try and set the record for how long they could wear a Dexcom. And, and it was pretty biocompatible. It was an, an issue having someone, something on your skin that long, the issue is, uh, there is something in the insulin which is irritating, which causes some irritation, inflammatory reactions. And some people, it's very individual. Some people have much more of a reaction than other people. Some people need to change their sets every two days or every three days. Other people can easily go four or five days. And, and the person that can go five days can do it, whatever the material is. Whatever the brand of insulin is, they can consistently do that. And the people that can go two days, doesn't make much difference what we put them on. They could only go two days. So there, there's a biologic reaction to the insulin and whether it's the insulin aggregation, whether it's the, uh, the excipients that are stabilizing the insulin, the, um, the phenol and these sort of things. Um, I, I think there's a lot of debate, a lot of question on that. And that's, but um, if you can eliminate that, that should protect those sites and, and cut down the inflammation and make them better on the long term. So I, and that, that may make it easier for the new sites you're finding. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's most of what I've seen in chat. Okay. And, and the other thing was, was adding like um, pramlatide to insulin and, uh, uh, Hadar, but uh, in Canada, in Toronto has done a number of close-up studies in also Jessica Cassell in, in Oregon. And it makes a big difference. Um, you can really flatten a postprandial curve with, with tramlithite. So normally the islet, whenever it releases insulin, it releases amylin. They're co-secreted. So as you, as, you're, as you eat and your insulin levels go up, your amylin levels go up. Pramlatide is the synthetic form of amylin. Amylin decreases gastric emptying. It lowers glucagon levels. And people with type one, at least for a number of years after diagnosis, secrete a lot of glucagon after they eat, which helps raise the glucose value when they're eating. So if you can suppress that, that's good. And it gives you a sense of satiety. It goes to your brain and makes you feel full. And it's delaying gastric emptying, which makes you feel full. So there are a number of things which slow the rise in food and glucose after a meal, which a controller can then handle a lot better. And, um, and also for people, I mean, I've had a, a number of our adolescents who had weight issues. And part of it was they're missing a hormone that helps control weight uh, when, when they have type one. So it, it's replacing that hormone. So it turns out pramlatide has a pH of four and insulin has a pH of 7.2. So you couldn't combine them and put it in a bottle. But if you wanted to replace physiologically what happened, you'd put them in the same cartridge and, and give them together. And um, so there, there's a group that has done that, they've taken the Lantus insulin, which has a pH of four, 
and combined it with um, um, the, the pramlatide with a pH of four. So they put them in the same cartridge and they've done a study giving it as injections and it worked quite well. And I think it would be even better in a pump. So you could put that into a pump and I think that would really help um, get to a full close-up also. So I, I think there's a lot of promise and, and there's a lot of things to be done in the future, both, both with um, the pumps and the sensors and the integration and the algorithms and the number of alarms, the ease of use, the decreased frequency of set changes and um, uh, automated detection of eating be by the watch or whatever. And, uh, and adding tramletide to it. I, I think the, the, we're getting much closer to a full close loop than, than, I mean, loopers have sort of known that, that you can, if you don't eat a huge carb meal, you can do pretty good um, with just sort of some announcement of about time you're gonna eat, uh, increasing things, getting prepared for it. Okay, now, uh, I have a couple uh, of questions on, uh, on complications, or you had mentioned about cognitive impairment, and we're just trying to clarify uh, more related to extended highs or lows? Highs. Highs. I mean, uh, in our studies, we, we follow kids from when they were, you know, six, eight, we, well, our, our youngest was six, but six, eight years of age through adolescence with serial MRIs and cognitive testing and every three months getting CGM data on them. So it was, it was like a long study, eight 10 years, a lot of money. And, and then looking at a group of controls, there are 120 kids with diabetes in about uh, 40 controls and looking at differences in, in their brain and their cognitive tests. And um, there were some changes observed and it was um, related not to a history of seizures or loss of consciousness or their percent time hypo, but it was related to their percent time in hyperglycemia. Okay, and then I'm gonna come back to a question we asked um, Rayhan and also Ann Peters. Um, and you say, you see, you see complications 15 years out, but we're curious about uh, those of us have been looping and have our times and range pretty good. Are you seeing complications self-correcting or will that be a 15 year or is that a one way that you just can't roll it back? It's a great question. And it partly relates to the aging process and how old you are, I think. So if you're young, you have much more rapid rates of collagen turnover. So I generally, there, for a, when we used to have urine testing, the risk of getting complications really began with the onset of puberty, despite the kids being in poor control. And it's because when they were younger, the hyper, they were turning over their collagen. It's like getting rid of red blood cells. So they had a much higher rate of collagen turnover. So if they were high, they would turn that collagen over. And, and I think those years really didn't count for much because they could turn their collagen over. As you get older, the rate of collagen turnover decreases. And the older you are, the, the slower the rate of collagen turnover. It's still, you know, roughly for a middle-aged person, it's probably around 15 years for all the collagen to cycle through and turn over. But one of the problems, like I showed you on that skin biopsy, was once you get non-enzymatic glycosylation, you get collagen cross-linking. And so you get secondary reactions that occur, which increase collagen cross-linking and make it harder to turn that collagen over. And so it sticks around, I think, a lot longer. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's a question uh, about uh, insulin antibodies or anti-insulin antibodies. Is there any thoughts you have on that? Well, there, everyone has them if you have type 1 diabetes. Um, and there are some people that have 
much higher titers. I think they're the people that were initially given beef pork insulin and, and dirty, uh, not highly purified insulin sold by uh, Lilly <laughs> and Noble and all the companies. And then they cleaned up and got what was called highly purified insulin. And then when you went to the recombinant DNA technology, the insulin became very purified. And, and you, I think we get much, much lower levels of antibodies now uh, than we used to. But there's some people that still generated antibodies and because you're continually taking insulin, you sort of can continue to trigger that. And, and so you have, if you have a high enough titer of antibodies, you can get, you can increase your insulin binding capacity in, in your serum. So when you take a shot, it can begin to bind uh, to the proteins in your blood and then to the antibodies, and then they can be released on a gradual basis. So it can, it can change sort of the insulin duration of action, I think, sometimes. Um, there are very few people, I've had a few kids who've had clear local reactions to insulin and um, where, where they, uh, they got these sort of um, eosinophilic granulomas um, that are, are a really firm nodule under the skin. It could be a mass of, of an inch, inch and a half, and it could last for um, <laughs> six months, a, a year. They could last a long time, and, and they are very rare. I had a kid that had that on Novolog and has been doing fine on Humalog. So occasionally you can make a, a brand or a switch or change the excipients in the insulin and, and it can make a difference. But um, those are th those get reported at the ADA meeting for the last few years because they were so unusual. So people would report them because they pretty much disappeared with the purified insulins. Um, we had another question about super boluses uh, in any of the New systems, do you know of any systems that are using the super bolus methodology to give more insulin up front and then um, cut the basal after the, the bolus is given? Yeah, I, I think that's what we do with everyone in closed loop. <laughs> I think if, if someone came, you know, if you look at the people have the carb insulin ratio calculations and normally, you know, you're, you're at uh, a 450 uh, 500 for meals and maybe for breakfast, you'd be at, at 350 or 400. And we just put like breakfast down to, I, I have a slide on that way at the beginning of this. Um, so we just have people give a lot more, uh, so the window is closed. Okay. Um, at, at a much, much higher carb insulin ratio um, from, from the beginning. So they're giving more insulin up front and, and, and really calculating that the, um, where was I? That was under tandem, I think here. Well, I thought I had a slide on that. Maybe I took it out. I'll just talk. But at any rate, we, we do do that. And I, I think it here, here's sort of the carbohydrate insulin ratio. So typically, you know, someone for breakfast might be on a 360 and the remainder of the day, 450. We just put that on the 400 or 300. These ratios, uh, this would be like for an adult. And then you see how they respond and then you make them more aggressive. So we, we calculate that they're going to be getting a higher amount of insulin for their carbs and that the back end is going to be shut down if they're, if they're at least the base will be shut down if they're, if they're tending low. Um, th these ratios don't work for young kids. Um, none of these calculations work for young kids. So don't, don't translate it down to a, a, a two to six year old. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of questions back on uh, beta bionics. Actually, Ed is going to be speaking to us uh, next month. Um, and I think a lot of us have been watching uh, the islet for quite a while. A um, couple of things, um, and I think it was Aaron Kowalski who said um, there probably isn't going to be a lot of incentive for insurance companies to cover a dual hormone because you're protecting on the low side and the closed loop systems 
ha make you have a lot less low side. Any thoughts on whether that will even be something that's covered? Yeah. <laughs> you expect anyone to predict what an insurance company is going to cover? <laughs> that's, a, that's, uh, a, that's a crazy question. I, I mean, okay. uh, it, it should be related to need. And I would think um, there are some people who have hypo one awareness where it would probably be a good idea to have some glucagon around. That's 30%. Uh, have, have hypo one awareness. I think if you're an athlete and that would protect you when you're exercising and um, th they would have a need for that. So I, I think there are certain situations where it could be very helpful and you will get tighter control with that, whether that makes a difference or not, whether you need to be, you know, at a 130 glucose average uh, with, with dual hormones, I, you know, and compared to a 150, 155, that will, will be the question and whether you can sell that um, as, as a long-term benefit to an insurance company. Um, so that just kind of eliminates my next question because there were several comments about Islet not having an exercise mode or an exercise button. But I, I guess if you have glucagon, you, yeah. you, you don't need it. Yeah, no, it was built, the algorithm was built with the concept of glucagon in there. Okay. All right. So, so you would see yourself heading down and you would get clicked on. Got it. Okay. Uh, if you were a betting man, because these questions are coming up, uh, would you put your money, um, if you had to buy a pump now, and that's a four-year commitment with insurance, um, I'm not going to hold you to this. And you don't have to answer either. <laughs> Any thoughts? I wouldn't buy one now. I'd wait probably if, if I if I had the opportunity to, I'd wait six months because uh, because other systems will be on the market then, and then you'll have a choice of three systems. I think it's or four systems. You potentially at that point in time could have tide pool loop. You which I I'm sure you've had many people spot speak about that here, so I didn't I really shouldn't even mention it, and you're having. Uh, Ed or Steve Russell talking about bionic pancreas. That's that's going to be another year from now. But in in you know in March April, you, you should have the 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 later advanced six seventy six eighty G. You you you'll have the Omnipod, and uh, you'll you'll have the. Um, the, the tandem control IQ, and they may have a new, you know, they may be upgrading and updating that. Uh, they can do that, you know, whenever they get the software cleared by the FDA, it's a, it's just a, an upgrade while, you know, when, when you um, when you go to their website. So I, I think it's, um, there's a lot of possibilities and they have a lot of flexibility that way in terms of making upgrades. If people, I know one of the questions would be, can they change your targets and things like that? Well, right now you can, but is that gonna be changed? Is, are they gonna have changes to their exercise module uh, when it comes around? I, I would expect these type of things would, would be things that would be seen down the road. And, and again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a new pump. It's, it's, um, it's a Tesla, it's a, the tandem Tesla upgrade. Got any, so, in your crystal ball, do you have any idea whether the, the Dana I pump, I, I have been in touch with them and they said it's all stalled with the FDA because they want U.S. testing. Do you think that will come to the U.S. market? Yeah, it, you know, it's a, um, it's a phone-based system. An Android system with the Dana pump, and uh, I think um, we were doing a study um, with Roman, and, and uh, the the platform involved a Matronic pump and the Matronic sensor, and there were a lot of issues in getting that thing communicating right. And once he went back to the Dana pump, it it worked like a charm in England, and they got really good results and had very happy participants. So. Um, I, you know, if there, as I say, the more, the merrier, and then you guys have to go through the dilemma of deciding which one is right for you. 
instead of having one choice, uh, now you, you, you have, you know, four choices potentially in four, you know, in four, six months. I mean, that, that's just uh, amazing. I, I mean, uh, you know, th three, four years ago, you had Metronic, and now I'm in the dark again. And then uh, I feel like Halloween here. I had that ghostly sort of a quality to me. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, yeah. So I, I think it's great. Uh, and, and I, I think every, all of you are smart people and you will look at the different systems and, and read the performance on them and talk to people who are wearing them. And I mean, one of the things that's so great now there's, and so terrifying is there's so much social networking like you're doing right now where people can get together and talk and, and, and share and, um, and see what the ups and downs are on each system and what they would like. So, well, here's one question that came up uh, a little bit earlier was, uh, do you think that these uh, new systems will actually kill looping? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, yeah, no, I think um, loop has um, a, a lot of the things that come out are not as customizable as loop. And for the people that like to customize things and, and get into how it works and, and have it on a, on a phone and a lot of the advantages with that. So there, there's, um, there's a, a whole infrastructure, you know, Loop was made by, by users. It was made by people with diabetes, poor people with diabetes. And, and I think it, it has that, that great appeal. And, and as it gets into a more commercial, where there is less intermediary things, you, you wouldn't need a Riley link and, and, and communication should be stronger and better. Um, I think it would be appealing. So I, I think it, um, and it has a good, a, a good base of, of followers that it's, it's uh, adapting. We talk about adaptation, it's a user base which uh, will gradually have the ability to adapt and change as users see more things they want and need. Okay, so. I, I have one more question because we didn't really talk on this. Uh, we talk a lot about Dexcom. Uh, we know about the Medtronic sensor, CGM. What are you thinking about the Abbott Freestyle Libre 3? And are there others that are that you see lurking in the background? Um, first of all, the Libre, it, it came from Abbott, which is up with the Navigator initially up here in the Bay Area. And, it, and when, at the time it came out, it was clearly the best sensor. Mm -hmm. It was much better than the others. It uses a um, uh, an osmium granite gradient, so it has a uh, very low um, energy requirement, um, very low oxygen dependency, and uh, was a very stable system. And that's how they came out as the first one that really, with the no cal, that went out there and was approved and in Europe initially and, and over here. So it's a, um, it's, it has good basic technology. They were reading a bit on the low side, uh, particularly in the lower range. They had a number of false positives and that's from the data I've seen been corrected with the Libre 3. Uh, and it has uh, a lot of potential uh, to be integrated. And once it, it can be integrated into different systems, I think um, it, it, would, it would be usable. There's, there's Sensionics, which is still out there with the implanted sensor, which is now getting approval for much longer duration. It's sort of been hard in COVID to do much with, uh, uh, with the system that requires an, an implantation, but it's, it certainly has um, some appealing advantages uh, for people who do worry about real estate, I guess, skin real estate. There's... Um, uh, Novo, uh, th there's a Novamax meter, which, and they have very good technology. It's the only really good, well-approved uh, meter for hospitals. It gets rid of a lot of interfering substances and, um, and we're gonna be using it in our hospital study. So they're working on developing a, a sensor. So that, that would be down the road a bit. So th there, yeah, I think, there's, there's a future and for different sensors, for different needs. Uh, I mean, the standard is gonna be no-cal 
uh, for all of them moving forward. I think we've crossed that bridge and, um, and they will, there, there's a level of accuracy that's the bar has been set where you need to be, so. Well, I, I, you know, I want to thank you. I am so grateful that you took your time to come talk to us. I would like to reserve the right to revisit with you next year if there's no cure yet uh, to see what's new and what, what else you've learned because you've shared so, so much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart and from this whole group. We really appreciate all well, the work. I had no did. idea what you wanted. <laughs> so I, I, I sort of just flew in different directions just to make, make it fun. It, it, it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank okay. you much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.